sometimes my ideas of a cool machine are a bit eccentric and this idea was no exception. You see, when I was 16 years old, I had come up with an idea that I thought would revolutionize the automobile industry. What if there was a way to build a continuously variable transmission and avoid using rubber or other weak materials as mechanical interfaces? What if there was a way to do it with good old American gears and get positive engagement that wouldn't slip or wear out as torque increased? Well, I ended up building my invention by welding together a bunch of old push rods that I cut up and assembled it with a couple of gear wrenches, some ready rod, a homemade crankshaft, springs, and brake cables from a bicycle. The final product looked like something that MacGyver would build to get off of Gilligan's Island. At the time, I was really proud of my invention and it actually did work. I had invented the world's first continuously variable transmission that used a positive engagement mechanism instead of a belt or a fluid. Or so I thought I did. You see, the CVT that I thought I had invented had actually been patented as early as 1994 when I was just two years old. It became obvious to me that I wasn't the first person to come up with this idea. After learning that, I realized the idea wasn't going to make me rich, and I ended up throwing away the one that I had built so many years ago. It just got lost in the matrix. But then, I got a 3D printer and this YouTube channel, and I remembered that one thing that I made that one time, and decided that I really wanted to make another version that I can 3D print so I could share the idea with you guys. And here it is. Admittedly, I did actually change how the machine works. My first machine like this did not have a variable crankshaft and instead varied the output by changing its point of attachment to the ratcheting mechanism. So it was changing the height at which the, the crankshaft attached to the ratchet. But this newer design is much more advanced because it has the addition of a neutral ratio. I do plan to show you guys how this thing works, but not yet, hold up. First off, if you're not familiar with what a CVT is, don't worry, I'm going to go over that. And I'm also going to go over some reasons why you would use a CVT, some reasons why you wouldn't, and I'll go over the specifics of how this CVT works, which is known as a ratcheting CVT. And then, as always, I'll pull out my cordless drill and demonstrate this thing flailing around like the idiotic invention that it really is. So a CVT is a really cool kind of transmission that's used in some cars, but is also extensively used in recreational vehicles like snowmobiles and four-wheelers. But why? Well, the answer to that question is because those things use gasoline engines. You see, gasoline engines have a range of RPMs where the engine is most efficient, usually at the lower end of the scale, and also a range of RPMs where the engine can output the most power. But here stands the problem. When you want to accelerate that vehicle, that four-wheeler or that snowmobile, you want to be able to harness the power of that engine as much as possible so that you can use a smaller and lighter engine to reduce the weight of the vehicle. And in order to do that with a multi-ratio transmission, you would need to have a lot of gears and shift solenoids so that you can always keep the engine in its power band. But that would increase the weight of the transmission, the weight of the vehicle, and decrease the total power to weight ratio, slowing you down. Enter CVTs, the answer to the problem. The reason that these are called CVTs is because for any given input RPM with the correct design considerations, you could achieve an infinite number of ratios between the lower and the upper limit in order to keep your engine loaded the perfect amount so that you could hold the throttle wide open while keeping the engine within the power band. So why don't all cars use these CVT things, right? I mean, they're so great you could harness the full power of the engine, decrease the weight and components, or make the engine run in its power band or its efficiency band. I mean, why not? Well, there are two reasons, and the second one is a little disappointing. Number one. So along with being known for their simplicity, lightweight design, power conversion abilities, they're also really well known for their frequent failures. Since they don't have any locked-in ratios, you can't really design one with gear mechanisms. Thus, they completely rely on having the necessary amount of sliding friction to work properly. Once that friction material wears down, the transmission can no longer transfer energy, which is the entire purpose of having a transmission. You'll understand what I mean if you've ever owned a snowmobile. The belts burn out quite commonly. 
a problem that's not acceptable in motor vehicles. Of course, there's a ton of other designs that have addressed these problems, but there is no perfect solution. Number two. This is the kind of reason where I lose a little bit of faith in humanity. A lot of consumers don't understand CVTs, don't understand why they're important or why they would want one in their car. Because of that, when CVTs first came out, a lot of them were programmed to act just like a normal transmission. That way the consumer could hear their engine revving up and down like it's supposed to. That's right. They made a transmission with an infinite number of ratios and they programmed it to use like five or six of them just to make the consumers happy. It's like buying a supercomputer and using it to play solitaire. It bothers me. Let's talk about how this thing works. First, it takes the rotational motion from the input shaft and if the cam lobes are somewhat offset, it turns that motion into a linear back and forth motion by moving this rod in and out and these ratchets take that linear-ish motion and rectify it into one direction of rotational motion. This design has three phases and the reason for that is to smooth out the output velocity which would never be able to actually move at a perfectly consistent velocity because of the way it is. If it only had one phase or one of these wheels it could just as well be a ratchet strap and if it only had two phases the backlash and the ratcheting mechanisms would cause significant stopping points. I assume that adding more than three phases would have diminishing returns. Now, before we get to the drill, I want to talk about this adjustment mechanism for the cam offset, because this is really, really cool. This is something that I had to think about for a couple of hours trying to figure out if it could even be done, and here's why. Imagine that this adjustment cap is directly attached to a smaller shaft inside here, and that shaft has a pinion gear for each cam and each cam has a rack of gears that mate with that pinion gear. In this example, turning the crankshaft without simultaneously rotating this adjustment at the same speed would adjust the height of the cams, which isn't really ideal. You would only be able to rotate the machine a quarter of a turn. So this seems a little bit off topic, but when you think about a tank, like a military tank, how do you assume that the steering works? Do they have two engines, one for each wheel, well, maybe, but some tanks use a system called dual differential steering, allowing for one large engine to drive the tank forward and backwards and one smaller motor that only needs to offset the output to the left and the right tracks. Since steering does not need to be as fast as driving, you could use an even smaller geared motor for the steering. This is what inspired me to create the gearing mechanism that's hidden underneath this cover. What's underneath this cover is a gearing mechanism that is derived from the dual differential setup that most tanks use. Uh, with the drive input removed, turned into an idler, and I folded up the whole thing into a nice little package of two planetary gear sets with the input shaft locked to one planetary carrier, the inside shaft locked to the other planetary carrier, the, the sun gear as a composite gear as an idler, one ring gear is locked directly to the frame, and the other ring gear is attached to this adjustment cover. Turning the adjustment causes a speed differential between the two planetary carriers, thus creating a speed differential between the inner and the outer shafts. Wow, say that word three times. Any, anyways, let's, let's spin this thing. Let's just make it go real fast and see if it blows up. So I got this removable handle. Take that off. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna start this, spinning it with a drill in neutral. And as I turn this cap this way, you'll see these cams come out and then it will start to increase the gear ratio. Uh, for uh, your reference, the output, the output from this machine is, is this weirdly shaped shaft right here. That is the output shaft. This is the input shaft, and this is the adjustment mechanism. So, let's get started. That's not a good start. Dang it, now I have to fix my machine.
What do you think? Pretty cool, huh? And finally, there's something inherent to this design that makes it kind of hard to classify it as a full-blown CVT. As a matter of fact, it just might be an imposter. To find out why, subscribe and come back next week. Maybe I'll make a video on it. In the next couple weeks, I'm going to be releasing the Fusion 360 files and the STL files to build this machine uh, so you could 3D print your own. I'll be releasing them on Thingiverse and when it is released you'll find a link in the description. I'm probably also going to make an assembly video because this is a very complex machine that's very hard to assemble and very hard to print. Hey, don't forget to follow me on Twitter and subscribe. And if you have any questions or suggestions for me, leave a comment below. If you'd like to help my CVTs reach a broader audience, then hit that like button, share this video with your friends. And if you'd like to become a patron, I would really, really appreciate that. Hey, thanks for watching. For those of you who stuck around this long, I figured I'd show you this gearing mechanism. I, I'm completely in love with this gearing mechanism. Well, you guys know I have some weird fascination with gears already, but... So, this is all it is. This is the whole thing. So, it is a carrier. A carrier. Ooh, it's a good thing I took that apart, because this was going to be welded together. Might have got a little wild with that. Um, <laughs> so, all it is, is two planetary gear sets joined by a sun gear. That's the only gear they share in common. Uh, one of these ring gears is attached to the frame via these little grooves around here. The other ring gear is attached to this cover with those grooves. And yeah, I, each carrier, uh, well first off, there's two shafts in here. One of them's the inner shaft that does the cam on the gears. The outside shaft is just has a little index mark on it. I'm gonna put this back together off video, cause yeah. But anyways, thank you for watching.